This is Jonathan Hansen, president of World Ministries International. And I want to welcome you to our warning television program. Wherever you're watching in the United States or around the world, welcome. We're actually doing it in our college classroom. We have uh, colleges that we start all through the world for Bible. If a person is serious, you can earn your credit all the way up to a doctorate degree. But we're going to be shooting right now uh, a program titled The Three Most Important Decisions in Life. The Three Most Important Decisions in Life. Again, we have a live audience here. And so uh, it's our staff and their families. If we make the right choices in these three areas, life will be lived to the fullest and God will be glorified. Life doesn't give people what they want, but what they believe. Everyone wants nice things, good health, happy days, but they don't automatically happen. Making right choices is what determines how life treats us. God has given us the right choice, but we are making the right choices. Here are three areas that matter most in our lives. Again, God has given us the right choice, but are we making the right choices? The scriptures give us the right choice, but are we making those choices? Number one, our master. Luke 10, 27. And he answered, said, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Matthew 22, 37 through 38. Jesus said unto him, Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, with all thy soul, you know, your soul is your will, mind, and emotions, and with all your mind. I've done sermons called The Battles in the Mind. Also, guard your heart. I put up a, a blog today and said on social media that America is in a spiritual problem. The problem is not guns, but it, there's a spiritual problem in America. In other words, it's a heart condition. It's a heart that needs to be changed. This is the first and great commandment. Then Deuteronomy 6, 5, And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. With all your heart. Do we love God with all our heart? See, that is really a question. Each one of us have to answer that. Do we love God with all our heart, with all our soul, with my emotions, with all our mind? If we love God with all of our heart, then we can keep relationship not only with God, but with our fellow men. Because no matter what happens, we can forgive. If our heart is right, you know, a root of bitterness can enter the heart. Dr. Buckhart has been with me in ministry for 21 years, and he has seen this happen. All over the world. If God does not allow your heart, if you don't allow God to guard your heart, if you don't guard your heart, let me tell you, a lot of problems can happen. Number one, our master. Again, we're talking about the choices in life, the three most important choices in life. What are they? Our master is one. We read the scriptures. Is God truly first? Not just mental assent. In your heart. Your choices. Your passion. What you live for. What you breathe for. Who will be the master of our lives? Will we choose to be the Lord of our own life? Or will we give that place to Jesus Christ? Many people have accepted the fact that Jesus is the only way to God. They've received him as their personal savior. But not all of these believers have made Jesus the Lord and master of their life. There's really only one thing we can give to God, and that is to surrender our will. You know, there's a song, I surrender all. But the question is, do we surrender all? Most people don't surrender all. It's a, it's a nice song. But when we surrender all, that means our will, our mind, our emotions, our heart, our future, 
our desires. It was man's will that got him into trouble to start with by deliberately disobeying the Lord's instructions in the Garden of Eden. It was man's will. Last week I shared on humility and spiritual warfare. How the devil is the master of pride. He caused an insurrection in heaven and on earth through his pride. And that's how he works through people on earth today, is our pride. Can we forgive? Can we do what God wants? Are we quick to forgive? Well, if you got too much pride, you can't forgive too fast. Then you put conditions on God or conditions on people. It comes down to a pride issue. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. If you want spiritual warfare, you must humble yourself. Do away with the pride. Damn the pride. Righteousness is the will of God. Selfishness is the will of man. I find nothing to boast in other than God. But if we boast in ourselves, that's pride. That's what Paul said. But pride can kill. Pride can destroy. Pride leads rebellion, including the first rebellion in heaven, was pride. It was man's will that got him into trouble, deliberately disobeying the Lord's instructions in the garden. The surrendered will means that we have given Christ the right to guide us according to his will for our lives. And while we are living in the will of God, he is the master and things will work for good. Can we give up our will? You know, it's a nice saying. I surrender all, but again, most people don't surrender all. They just don't. It's a nice little song. But that's why most people don't move with authority, power, anointing. They don't move in that area of great grace like I talked about some months ago. Great grace. You have levels of grace. All grace, more grace, great grace. And the first century apostles moved in great grace. The supernatural was normal. Today, the supernatural is not normal in very few people's lives. Very few people move in great grace because their heart is not just not close enough to God. They have too much of their will and their pride that controls them. Then they want to do great things, but they can't do great things because they are controlling their own life. So you don't move with great anointing, more power, more authority. You can't do it. God resists the proud, gives grace to the humble. So that whole message last week on humility and spiritual warfare. The surrendered will means that we have given Christ the right to guide us according to his will for our lives. And while we're living in the will of God, he is master. And then things will work out. It took me a while to, to get there. I was 31 years old, even though I'd been a youth pastor and then I had a career in law enforcement. I took that, that first uh, supernatural dream that changed the course of my life, and that was because I couldn't forgive somebody for about five years. And I said I forgave, but, but I really hadn't. And once God dealt with my pride, where I truly could forgive, then I moved in the supernatural. And I'm talking about something serious, not just because you're mad that, you know, something little happened to you. I'm talking about... Somebody that raped and constantly raped my former wife. So I'm talking about something serious, not just because you got your feelings hurt. Or somebody didn't understand in good communication, now you're upset with them. We must be able to deal with our pride issue. Can we do it? So th the first thing is our master. The second thing is our mate. Now we're talking about three most important decisions in life. Jesus is our master. And then our mate. Who will be our mate for life? Well, Genesis 2.18, let's look at that. It says, And the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helpmate for him. 21 says, And the Lord God said, 
caused a deep sleep to fall on Adam, and he slept. And he took one of his ribs and closed up the flesh instead thereof. 22. And the rib which the Lord had, God had taken from man made a woman and brought her unto man. And Adam said, This is now bone of my bone, flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore shall a man leave his mother and father and cleave to his wife, and they shall be one flesh. So who is our mate for life? Well, I've seen many people make the wrong decisions when it comes to marriage. Sometimes because loneliness. Sometimes because of stubbornness. Sometimes because of just plain old lust. I've often told people that it's better to be alone to be with the wrong person. You know, divorces, <clears throat> which are 52% in the church, I'm sure they all agree with that verse. It's better to be alone than with the wrong person. There are worse things than loneliness and celibacy, like abuse and violence, betrayal, for example. Choosing a life partner should be approached according to scriptural guidelines and the consultation of parental and spiritual authority. I believe in courtship. We've been taught courtship. Should be going through spiritual authority, both parents and the church. And above all, the leading of the Holy Spirit in one's heart. You know, I remember when I was a young man, and I had gone through Bible school, but... Uh, you know, you, you think you, you have the world by the tail, but in reality, I still needed my father and, and the spiritual authority over my life to make really good choices. Nobody knows anything when they're, they don't have the world by the tail and, and you know, when they're in their teens and 20s. It just doesn't happen. Like I said, I, I had to really repent of Areas in my life, unforgiveness. It was 31 when I had my first supernatural dream, which changed the direction of my whole life. Where now, I'm traveling the nations, meeting with the leaders. But it was a constant process of dealing with one's pride and being under proper authority. I've always had an, an apostle over my life since 1985. Some people say, I don't need one. Yeah, and you're not going anywhere, are you? People that boast, it's just me alone with God. I look at their life and they're not going too many places. Where others I see moving around the world. I need one, we all need one. We all need a covering. We all need to understand these things. And if you don't, you're not going very far. Many people could reach millions, but instead they reach 20 or 30. And the key could be just flat pride. Choosing a life partner should be approached according to scriptural guidelines and the consultation of parental and spiritual authority. What God joins together will be fruitful and without doubt the best thing that could happen to us. So the first thing, we're talking about the three most important decisions in life. Our master, our mate, and our mission. Let's look at Proverbs 21.19. Proverbs 21, 19 says, It's better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. <laughs> I'm, I was just going about, I was just about going to say, and every man in this room said amen, but I said, I better not do, I better not go there. I better not go there. There could be more uh, uh, in need of counseling, family counseling, uh, at the end of the day. But uh, it is better to dwell in the wilderness than with a contentious and angry woman. Oh, somebody said amen. He's a brave young man. And he's not married yet. <laughs> if he's married, we'll see if he's that brave to say amen. <laughs> so what will be our mission in life? God has created us all with gifts and callings that empower us to fulfill the mission intended by him. The stages of life include survival, success, and significance. When we are young, we are trying to survive the cost of education, the raising of children, and all that life throws our way. When we have reached a, a middle age, 
midlife, we usually have achieved some measure of success in terms of a nice home, a car, some money in the bank. But when we grow old or older, we think of what our legacy will be. What are we leaving for the benefit of future generations? Have we added value to the lives of others? How will our legacy continue to do after we're gone? What is our real significance? Determining our ultimate mission will usually take place after some years of trial and error and learning some wisdom from experiencing life. This is something we should all think about. God has a mission prepared for us and all that will result in significance. He has a mission for us. If we make the right choices in these three areas, life will be lived to the fullest and God will be glorified. Psalm 72, 19. Blessed is his glorious name forever, and let the whole earth be filled with his glory. Matthew 28, 18 and 20. Jesus came and spoke unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Go you therefore, teach all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I've commanded you, and lo, I am always with you, even unto the end of the world. I mean, that's our mandate, isn't it? Amen. That's our mandate. Go into all the... Why, why do we go into the nations? And we go to all of the continents. I've never been to Antarctica, but I've been uh, everywhere else. <laughs> but why do we go? Because of the mandate. Because it's our mission. It's our purpose. We're fulfilling the Great Commission. He ascended. He said, go make disciples, but first tarry for the baptism of the Holy Spirit so you have the power and authority to represent me in my name. So you have the power and authority to represent me. God isn't coming out of heaven no matter how much you pray to do your job. He ain't coming out till the battle of Armageddon. God doesn't want to fight your battles for you. He wants to fight them with you. In other words, you have to be his ambassador. You have to go and witness and lay hands on the sick and be salt and occupy and take dominion and put the right people into government. And all the prayer in the world is not going to do it. God is not going to fight your battles for you. He's going to fight them with you. But when he ascended, he gave you that responsibility. You're an ambassador. Go represent me now. I'm praying for so-and-so to get saved. Have you witnessed to them? Somebody better. Your prayer isn't going to do it alone. We have a responsibility to be an ambassador of Jesus Christ, to do what Jesus did. He went to the lost to heal and save and deliver. And then Paul went to disciple. We covered that. We said how Jesus' ministry was to the lost. Now, Jesus could disciple, and he discipled the 12, and they turned into apostles. But he, everywhere Jesus went, it was like an evangelist to the lost, to heal, to save, to deliver. The epistles, the apostles, Paul, they went to disciple, to train, to equip the church. Now they could both cross over. Paul could certainly lead people to Christ. He could certainly pray for people. Our ministry, we lead people to Christ. We pray for people. I do it even on airplanes. But at the same time, we're trying to get 200,000 people in every nation reading our news articles because we want to equip the church, train the church, prepare the church so they can do battle in their nation according to the book of Psalms, to bring the glory of God upon their nation through their church. So we are trying constantly to equip the church. When I go places, apostolically and prophetically, I'm trying to equip the church. Our Bible schools, it's trying to equip the church so the church can do battle. Luke 19, 13, Luke 19, 13. And he called his ten servants and delivered them ten pounds and said unto them, Occupy till I come. Occupy. There's a whole principle about the talents. If we use our talents, God multiplies them. If we don't use our talents, we, we lose our talents. And then there's the area of responsibility where God judges us accordingly. Uh, you read it in the scriptures where he chastised the one that didn't use his talents. So we have a responsibility. Much 
taught, much learned, then we need to use that knowledge. We need to use that wisdom to represent Jesus Christ. So God judges us according to how we're prepared to serve him. And we need to use our talents, our, our wisdom, our knowledge, what we've acquired to serve the Lord. And we serve the Lord in these areas as we continue to be equipped. The more, why do I take Bible courses? I don't need any more degrees. I got three doctorates. Why do I take them? Because the more wisdom I have of God, the more I can help people at a higher level. I need to acquire more and more and more of the knowledge and wisdom of God. And that's the only reason I take Bible courses. Not for degrees anymore. But if I'm going to minister at the highest levels, then I need the wisdom of God. And I need to continue to grow in the wisdom of God. Because God is so wise, we'll never ascertain everything of God. So we continue to persevere. And in love with the Lord, in love with the master, you know, not lose our first love. So mo most, much of the church has lost their first love. Matthew 5, 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We've talked about this before. Poor in spirit doesn't mean that we're, you know, we're, we have a poverty spirit. God forbid we should not have a poverty spirit. That's a curse. But we're, we're not supposed to have a haughty spirit. We're supposed to be meek. We're supposed to be mild. We're supposed to be able to forgive. We're supposed to be able to do these things. God resists the proud. You know, people might think, everyone, everybody in this room could think, man, you're, you're picking on me. Well, everybody has a measure of pride. And, and to the degree of pride you have, it depends how dangerous you are. How much God will or will not use you. How much Satan will instead use you and attack you, and abuse you. We must understand pride is damnable. That's why when we fast, we are attacking the pride, self-preservation. Instead of relying on ourself, now we have to rely on the Spirit of God to give us the strength to do His will. And we do that when we face insurmountable challenges. Like when I go into countries of genocide, I have to fast. Why? Because... My pride wants to preserve my life and doesn't want me to go into those countries. So you have to deny your pride, self-preservation. You start fasting. And I've taken several 40-day fasts. Not to boast that I fasted, but to overcome my fear and my pride. I've shared if you want to say something to a neighbor and you're afraid, fast a little bit. A couple days might be all you need. Now you can go talk to your neighbor. But the three most important decisions in life. One, our master. Is he the most important you know, in your life? Who will be your master? Who is your master? Will we choose the Lord of our life or will we give that place to Jesus Christ? Will we choose to be the Lord of our life? Again, these, these questions are something that most people would say, no, I'm not going to be the Lord of my life. But most people are the Lord of their life. If they're under authority, they don't want to go to the authority for counsel because it might be against what you want. And God forbid, somebody tell me what I don't want. Well, if they're truly your covering, they should be able to talk into your life and you should be able to receive it. If not, you have too much pride. I don't think you know more than they do. I just think you have too much pride. If we dealt with these issues, we wouldn't see 52% divorce in the church. It's because there's too much pride when they got married. So who will be Lord of your life? Two, the most important decision. The second is your mate. And three is your mission. What is our mission? All of our mission should be to extend the kingdom of God on earth. And it doesn't matter if you're working a gas station, a hospital, a dental clinic, uh, if you're a pastor, missionary. Our most important mission in life is to extend the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's to lay hands on the sick. It's to disciple, to cast out demons, to do these things that we all can do. We don't all have to be full-time, what we call full-time. Now, I believe full-time 
is if you just serve God faithfully, whatever you do. It doesn't matter if you work in a business. If that's where God's called you and you serve him faithfully, okay, you're serving the Lord full time. Now, I do understand, you know, full time ministry, people call full time, is when you do nothing else but work in the church or as a missionary and things like this. But we all can be full time by just being faithful to the calling of the Great Commission, being faithful to disciple, to witness, to pray, to cast out demons, to, to lay hands on the sick. If we do that faithfully, God is pleased with us. If we make the right choices in these three areas, life will be lived to the fullest and God will be glorified. The three most important decisions in life. Now, ladies and gentlemen, if you are watching this warning television program, what are the most important decisions in your life? Is Jesus your master? Is he really your master? Then your mate. Now, if you've already married somebody, then you, you need to do everything you can to make that marriage the best uh, that it can be on earth, which it can be beautiful. But you're going to have to really deal with your, your heart, your pride. Because all problems in marriage result from the pride where you just cannot forgive. And you're not going to find a perfect man or woman. They're just not one. No, not one, for all of sin and come short of the glory of God. If you're looking for perfection, you better look in heaven. But forget looking on earth. And your mission. What is your mission in life? What is it? I live and breathe to extend the kingdom of God. I, I can't think of doing anything else. I want to do this until I have no strength. My mission is to extend the kingdom of God on earth. And I do it because the number one choice in my life is he's my master, he's my Lord, he's my savior, he's my God. And I want to serve him, I want to please him, I want to extend his kingdom on earth. If you want to get our newsletters, you can just telephone 360-629-5248, 360-629-5248. Or you can look and see the addresses on the screen where you can write to us, you can send emails to us, you can look at my website. Uh, we do need your help to stay on your local television station. Uh, this costs money. I know recently we just sent out an email asking for everybody who gets my newsletters to give something. Some could give five, some could give 10, 20, 50, maybe 100, maybe 1,000 or more. Do what you can so we can continue to get the gospel out. We can continue to stay on your local television station. May God richly bless you. I'll see you next week.